209 people were arrested. 208 of those charges were dropped. One person served time, and that was for legitimately assaulting a police officer. 208, I think, was the number that was dropped. We just saw the, the night of rage. We see people outside Brett Kavanaugh's home. We just saw Elon Omar get, get arrested. We saw Stephen Colbert's people in the Capitol. Those charges were just dropped. The problem is the selective prosecution of a political class of persons that don't agree with the narrative. This is the definition of tyranny. I'm so glad you're joining me. This is an important uh, episode. We have Dr. Gold with us. She is the founder of America's Frontline Doctors, Simone Gold, MD, JD, internationally known as the doctor who went viral. Dr. Gold is formerly 20 years plus board certified emergency physician and author of the best selling book, I Do Not Consent My Fight Against Medical Cancel Culture. Dr. Gold's mission is to make America's frontline doctors a leading voice of common sense, boy, has she done that, and scientific clarity in the fight to defend our civil liberties. Dr. Gold graduated from the Chicago Medical School before earning her Juris Doctor from doctorate from Stanford University Law School. She's worked in Washington, D.C. for the Surgeon General, as well as the chairman of the U.S. Senate Labor and Human Resources Committee. This is all very important because of the story we're about to tell. And in July 2020, Dr. Gold organized the America's Frontline Doctors White Coat Summit in Washington, D.C. I know you all remember this, which rapidly drew 20 million views online. Currently, AFLDS.org receives over 7 million million page views per month. And her personal following on Twitter is over 400,000 people. She is a voice to be reckoned with, and she is a frequent guest on media outlets across the country. She's appeared in USA Today, Associated Press, The Guardian, New York Times, many publications. She has been featured on nationally syndicated programs such as Tucker and Ingram and uh, The Glenn Beck Show and uh, Charlie Kirk Show, Dennis Prager, you name it. America's Frontline Doctors and Dr. Gold are based out of Naples, Florida. Welcome to the program, Dr. Gold. How are you today? Good afternoon, happy to be here. I'm so glad uh, to see you. And let me tell you, I am shocked by this story. I, I, I honestly have no words to describe uh, when I found out uh, that, that uh, about the sentence, about what happened. Um, ja the January 6th event was clearly in the news every, every single day, calling it a capital riot. I disagree with that. I don't think there was a riot, um, but I would love to hear from you the story behind what happened and what you are facing now and how you're being made an example of to me, that's how I see it. And so I would love to find out what happened on January 6th, Dr. Gold. Well, for one thing, the conservative media is not reporting as it really was. You are absolutely right that overwhelmingly, this was not a riot, overwhelmingly. I myself went silent until sentencing, just because that's what the lawyers advised. And I, I didn't see the point in poking the judge until he sentenced me. Uh, in retrospect, I probably should have gone out public because he was so viciously, uh, aggressively against who I am as a human being that I, I don't think there would have been any harm in speaking out. But we need conservative media to have reported accurately on that day. First of all, there were two sides. There's the east side and the west side. The west side is a side that had scaffolding. And that was a side where you saw some pictures of some people kind of climbing the scaffolding. And there were certainly little pockets that looked a little bit more violent. Um, I would submit to you that I personally saw evidence of a little bit of violence after people were, uh, you know, tear bombs were, were thrown. In other words, the people were not necessarily violent until they were stimulated by the police. Having said that, I personally wasn't even on the west side. I was on the east side. Side. The east side was not violent at all. There was no scaffolding. It was just peaceful. There were tens of thousands of people on the east side, but most people were on the west side because you passed that side first if you had been coming from the ellipse. The reason I was on the east side, people don't realize this, is I was actually an invited guest speaker that day. There was 20 or 25 people that were invited guest speakers at various locations, and I made my way along with about 20 five other people, kind of in a Congo line, to that location. And when we got to that permitted spot, which was, you know, kind of a platform and a stage and um, microphones set up, all of a sudden we were not allowed in. And I, I see that video that you're showing right now. Um, I, I, when I was inside the Capitol, which I'll, I'll explain how I got there, but there I was giving my 
speech. But the reason I was forced to give the speech inside the Capitol is the permitted area was summarily uh, not accessible to us at the last moment. So what I do all through the lockdowns was I speak on, on health policy and health freedom, constitutional freedom around people's health and their own bodies. So I decided to do that. I had my speech in hand and I, I was at the top of the Capitol steps and I started giving my speech. And um, at some point, the doors opened I'm from the inside. My very important guest in this hour is Dr. Gold. And I am so glad that she decided to spend some time with me in this hour because I want to learn straight from her what happened on January 6th. She has been sentenced to do time in federal prison. This is, uh, it's beyond what I can even fathom and I'm sure it is for her too. And so let's go back, right back. You were, you were inv an invited guest. You were on the East side and, and then you started to approach where you were going to speak. The place we were due to speak, uh, somebody in a position of authority canceled it. And I was left standing there with knowing there was tens of thousands of people that were walking over from the ellipse. And there was already tens of thousands of people. So I decided to speak really is what I did. So I was standing on the top of the Capitol steps speaking. Now, I had no AV equipment, so really almost nobody could hear me. So I stopped after about a minute or two. But that's why I was on the top of the Capitol steps. And at some point, somebody opened them from the inside and I walked in along with other people. I want to emphasize that had I chosen not to walk in, I would have been trampled. Having said that, I, you know, I wasn't thinking of it one way or another. But when you come to it from a legal perspective, there was nowhere to go but inside when there's tens of thousands of people pushing behind you. That's how I found myself in the Capitol. Once inside the Capitol, I continue to do what I've been doing for, for two years now, which is I speak publicly on health freedom on the fact that our constitution um, gives us an inalienable right over our body. And that's what I speak about. And there's plenty of video showing me walking between the ropes, being very peaceful and giving my health policy speech. And, and that's what I did. I have to tell you, there's been so much um, miscategorization of that day that it's hard to believe, but where I was, was entirely peaceful. I had no idea at the time that this was going to become um, distorted beyond all recognition. When we, uh, find, for the first time when I was asked to leave, finally a, a police officer came up to me when I was actually speaking, giving my speech, and he kind of put his hands on me to encourage me to leave, and I looked at him, and then I walked out, and that's exactly what happened. So I had no idea this was going to become uh, magnified the way it was. It's, it's beyond all recognition. We walked out, we, we hung around for a little bit, and then we walked on, and that was it. And then <laughs> we saw what the media made of that, and that was it. The avalanche, the avalanche of words uh, to describe this event that are not accurate. The avalanche of, yeah. um, of blowing this out of so many proportions, it doesn't have a proportion left. It's been amazing to me how they have, um, how they've talked about this in the press. It's always a riot. It's always an insurrection. It's always all these words. You didn't see that. You, you, you didn't witness that. And I did witness tape where the officer was waving people in and that door could have only been opened from the inside. So the people walked in thinking they were invited as the cops stood there on the side, smiling as people were walking through it within the rope area. That's what I saw. We, Is that accurate? We have, to be, yeah, we, we have to be the living witnesses. There was a dearth of camera equipment. There was a dearth of media equipment. In retrospect, that was odd. I didn't pick up on it at the time, but there was virtually no media there. I think that was a setup because had there been a, a lot of media cameras, people would have seen with their own eyes that there were thousands and thousands and hundreds of thousands, maybe a million, million and a half people in the city total. Certainly on my side of the Capitol, which was the smaller side, the east side, I think there was 80,000 people easily. But there was no cameras really recording all of this. We have to stand as witness. There were moms with baby carriages. There were grandparents. There were people singing Kumbaya, literally Kumbaya. There were people praying. There were people happy, joyful. That's what we saw. That was the vast, vast, vast majority of people. And then, and then the real crime, though, is is that the media and was absent in categorizing this accurately. And then the government went after these people in a way that we've never seen in our in our nation. Political protests are ubiquitous in a country that allows free speech. May I bring people back to January of 2017, when President Trump was inaugurated, there were protests. I don't know if you recall, but they were kind of violent. There were fires. There were people who threw kind of homemade little bomb kind of cocktails at people. My recollection is 209 people were arrested. 208 of those charges were dropped. 
One person served time, and that was for le legitimately assaulting a police officer. 208, I think, was the number that was dropped. We just saw the, the night of rage. We see people outside Brett Kavanaugh's home. We just saw Elon Omar get, get arrested. We saw Stephen Colbert's people in the Capitol. Those charges were just dropped. The problem is the selective prosecution of a political class of persons that don't agree with the narrative. This is the definition of tyranny. If you live, uh, if, if you are a member of Kim Jong Jim, oh my goodness, I forget the name, the name of the North Korean dictator. If you're a member of his family, yeah. you're not going to be charged with a crime. That's what we're seeing here in America. If you are a member of, of these judges' family, if you're a member of the Clinton family, if you're a member of the Biden family, you're not going to be let off in handcuffs and shackles the way Peter Navarro is let off, the way they threatened Steve Bannon. So I'm here to wake people up. I'm a doctor. I'm a lawyer. If they can do this to me for free speech, they can do it to you next. Amen. Amen. And you know what? I, I I wanted to go through your um your entire biography because I wanted people to understand what a presence you've been in the health community, the doctor that you are, because you are such a threat to them when we were speaking out about health freedom. They wanted to silence you. This is all about picking your politics and then deciding who they're going to charge criminally. This is absolutely outrageous. This is appalling. This is this is horrific. And we as an American public should not take this. People were waved into the Capitol. Like you said, most people that walked in didn't even know that there was something wrong with that. It is the people we ha we did pay for that. I'm, I'm pretty sure. I don't know even how they got trespassing charges, but they keep saying armed insurrection. That's absolutely incorrect. Nobody was armed. <laughs> and this is why nobody had a gun charge. There were not gun charges handed out to everybody is because uh, they couldn't anyway with concealed carry, but also the fact that they weren't armed. So they have painted a story. They've painted it. It's yeah. been, a, I, I, have you just been appalled? Here, yeah. And here's an easy fact that people can know. So when I, I decided to take a plea, which is a tragedy in itself, but uh, they, they, they squeeze you so hard that you really are, are in a position that you can't. And I'll talk about that in a minute. But here's a, a neat little fact that people can reflect upon. If this was such a dangerous insurrection, then how come my plea agreement says that the amount of damage that was done to the Capitol was 1.5 million? We're talking about an insurrection that's so violent you could barely buy a cup of coffee in Washington, D.C. We had a, you know, an hour of rioting in the summer of 2020. You had expenses that exceeded a million and a half dollars. They're talking about an entire day of insurrection and the entire bill to the Capitol was 1.5 million. I know because I signed that piece of paper that that's, that that's what it was. So, so, so good luck claiming this as an insurrection. I, you, I'm sure people are interested why I took a plea and why you know people are taking pleas if, if what I'm telling you is the truth. Well, there's video evidence of everything that I'm saying, so you don't have to just rely on my word. But the government, you, you know I'm a lawyer, you, you said that, thank, thank you. So the government's role in our criminal justice system, the government and the defense have very different roles. The defense exists just to really defend the defendant. Whether the defendant is guilty or innocent, his job or her job is to defend the defendant. The government, though, has two jobs. The government is to prosecute the case, but the government is also what's called an officer of the court. Officers of the court have to walk kind of a narrow ethical line. One example is they're not allowed to bring charges that they don't have the elements to prove it. But what the government has done in this instance is they've overcharged January 6th defendants so aggressively you can't even recognize the situation from the paperwork that they file. For example, in my case, and people need to hear this, I was charged with five crimes, the only one of the five that you could even say there was any evidence to, to look at was the one I accepted a plea, which was trespass. My guest is Dr. Gold, and I'm so, um, I'm so happy to have her on because this story needs to be told. And let me remind everybody, I know that you know this out there, but five people did not die that day. Uh, in fact, they died after in different circumstances. But the news stories, even today in the news today, headline news, they are still giving that story. And it's completely false. It did not happen. Five people did not die that day. Also, the fire extinguisher story that was passed around the media for, uh, for years uh, now, uh, for 
for a year now absolutely did not happen, completely falsified. And the coroner said it never happened. The 140 officers that claimed they had injuries too, um, never were shown. Um, in fact, uh, never talked about. And I'm not quite sure how 140 officers would have received those kinds of injuries of assault when uh, people didn't even have weapons. There, This was absolutely lie after lie after lie. And I'm so glad um, to hear from Dr. Gold because she was there. So you were talking about the charges and it was a trespassing charge, correct? The plea? Yes, I have so much to say about what you just said, but let me pick up on the on the, so let, the role of the government. The role of the government in any kind of prosecution is not just to prosecute the case, but also to be an officer of the court. To be an ethical, honorable officer of the court, there are certain rules. And one of them is that you cannot overcharge for crimes for which you don't have elements, the proof of the elements of the crime. But what they've done to all the all the January 6th defendants I've seen is they've overcharged. For example, in my case, they charged me with five uh, five counts of which there was evidence only, possibly evidence only for one. The other three included disorderly of which they had no evidence because I was never disorderly. And they also charged me with a felony obstruction of which they had no evidence whatsoever. But the that charge, that felony charge carries a 20 year potential prison term. This is why people are taking plea deals. Because who can risk going to trial on a 20 year felony in a DC jury uh, where we know that the jury pool has been contaminated by, for example, the the tri the show the, the show theater that the Congress put on recently. This is why people are taking pleas. I also want to share with you, you just pointed out two very uh, terrible inaccuracies and lies that the media is reporting. One of them that five people died that day or related to that day. That kind of ill reporting is so dangerous. My judge in my case repeated that lie. He used that as evidence against me. And I submit to you as a lawyer, I was offended because not only was it factually inaccurate, what would it have to do with me anyway if it was accurate? It has nothing to do with me. Those are reasons why my judge in particular did not display a judicial temperament. Judicial temperament means you can look at the facts on the ground and you can look at the, the, the defendant dispassionately and put it together and make an assessment. But when you have a judge saying from the bench that I did not show remorse for five people who died as, relate, as related to the Capitol, you have a judge who showed himself to be factually inaccurate and so irretrievably biased that he lacks proper judicial temperament. Amen. Amen. I, I can't imagine sitting there. I, I can see the press doing it because we know what the press is all about. But to see a judge sit there and say that, I can't even imagine what you must have been thinking. He should be I, humiliated. And I want to share with you I, something. This is, this will be a little bit of a bombshell just for you because I'm enjoying this interview so much. And you're going to ask me a follow-up question I'm probably not going to answer. Here you go. This judge and I went to law school together. We were in the same law school class. We absolutely knew each other. And it's a small law school. There's only 150 people in a law school class at Stanford University I knew him fairly, I knew, I knew him, and I think there will be more coming out on that. But there was so much animus from the judge that day. Some of it was political, some of it was personal. Wow. Wow. First time and I've sentenced. Said it on national air. There you go. Oh my gosh. I'm so glad you that said that. Stanford really University am. Law School, class of 93. Chris Cooper <laughs> and my maiden name, Simone Tizis. There you go. Wow. Mm -hmm. Wow. Thank you for that. Because I, it had to have been some bias. It had to have been some things going on here because I can't exactly. imagine spewing the lies and I can't imagine the sentence. And the sentence is two months in federal prison. <laughs> Let's just take a pause. Does anybody I, I don't know have ever saying. heard of anybody going to prison for a misdemeanor? Just saying. No. no. <laughs> and nothing was done. I mean, it, it, even if they even, even if they said, well, I don't even know how they can get away with trespassing because people were waved in. The door had to be open from the inside. Well, it was it was an invitation from the inside. We have video of it. <laughs> it's you yeah. know, um, I know that AOC ugh, um, said a few things about that and dropped the you know, dropped that information. But it is kind of interesting that the media won't report on it. But I should not be shocked because this is what we've been getting every single day. You know, 140 officers. Think about this for a moment. 140 officers standing there taking an assault and didn't fight back because no one had marks on them. I haven't 
I mean, we have. Let me give you some information. Let me give you some information on that because they tried. They tried that trick with me, and they did this in court. And it's all in my transcript. So the government shows a video of, of me in the general vicinity on the outside, and and a few feet away, there's an officer who I I remember it. He, I can make. I looked at his eyes. He looked to me as an ER doctor that he was about to faint. Whatever it was, he stumbled. He either fainted or he kind of tripped. He kind of fell several feet in front of me. Between me and him, there were many people because it was so crowded. There was maybe five or six people between us. As he fell to the ground, the crowd chanted, and you can see it, get him up, get him up, get him up, get him up, like that. He was on his feet within three or four seconds. This is all on video. Nonetheless, the government in my case tried to submit to the judge that I was somewhere in the vicinity of an officer who had been assaulted. So I can tell you right now that that's what they're calling assault. A video where you can see the man was not assaulted and he was lifted to his feet by the crowd and he walked off. That's what the government is portraying as an assault. That's probably what they're talking about. Absolutely. And you know what? Had one officer actually been assaulted, you don't think they would have taken out their firearms and said they would have had reason to do uh, to, to, to take out Americans that they that, that that they thought were assaulting them? Of course they would have. I mean, look at any kind of event. If, you, if, if something happens with an officer, you've got 10 or 20 officers right there, right, to make a very big deal about that and to save an officer. That didn't happen. 140 I'm officers, standing. when they kept... I was standing when right next to officers. There's a picture of me in the Washington Post with officers walking behind me looking bored. There's other video where an officer's right next to me. He's got his gun right next to me, holding his gun, looking utterly unbothered. The mood where we were on the east side of the Capitol was just like a rock concert, kind of excited and pumped up, but absolutely nobody was afraid. Nobody was fearful. Certainly no officers were afraid. And uh, it's, it's, it's I, a big lie. <laughs> yes, and absolutely, you know, the people were there to hear the Electoral College count. Why would they interrupt their own meeting? Why would they have interrupted the own the, their own meeting, their own reason for being there unless they were invited in? And I know that the FBI absolutely had a presence there, as they do in most things, uh, pretending to be patriots with the brand new MAGA hats. So it was absolutely ridiculous. This was this was a concerted effort and a, and a three ring circus and a kangaroo court all the way around. It still is to this day. And the hearings on it is just even more circus acts that we as an American public have to indulge. We know nothing happened that day. And the people that walked in on the protesters that walked in on the Kavanaugh hearing, when they did that, they didn't incur any charges. There was really nothing that happened to them. They walked into a proceeding that would be trespassing to be a protester in that situation during those hearings. Nothing happened. And like you said, Stephen Colbert's staff, not a thing because, well, politics. And so yeah. as you were in court, were you allowed to say some of these things? Were you allowed to say all of these things that we're saying now? Yeah. So I, of course, have never been a criminal defendant. So I thought when I was showing up because I took a plea, when I was showing up for sentencing, I thought the judge would just give the sentence. That's actually not what happened. What happened was the government said very nasty lies about me. And there really wasn't much opportunity. And that really took me by surprise because I don't, I, to me, that's a trial. You know, you know, they say yeah. their thing, I say my thing. That's not what it was. And that really took me by surprise. Once you take a plea, you know, you, I don't really expect to talk very much, but I also don't expect the other side to be able to put forward something that sounds negative towards me. To I just prosecute people you. to understand why people like me take pleas because they threw a 20 year felony at me. And I, the person yeah. who would have adjudicated that is a D.C. jury, which we know is 96 or 97 percent on one we'll be political right back. side. My guest, Dr. Gold, smart woman. And I have been so impressed with Dr. Gold and her forthright testimony. I've always been impressed with her videos, speaking out, and everything she has always said uh, since this whole nonsense of COVID came out in 2020 has been amazing. And she's helped so many. She even helped the frontline doctors or who helped my husband, and he's alive today because of them. So I reward all of their efforts and what they have done for the American people. Now, um, I would have taken a plea knowing I was in a kangaroo court too, because this is not, this is no longer about justice. This is about making sure this has as much minimal impact on your life. And 
I believe that any of the acts described as vandalism, like the single broken window, give me a break, were done by FBI posing as patriots. We all know they were there. It was, it was uh, people were actually voicing concerns that they were there and among them. And then we also had Antifa dressed up in MAGA clothing too. And all of that started to come out. But of course the media doesn't touch it with a 10 foot pole because it's truth. So in those charges, you took this plea deal. And I, I agree with you, Dr. Gold, that you probably felt like you were in a trial again. How dare they? Because it was supposed to just be that sentencing, right? After taking that plea, which you should have never had to have taken. This is an absolute kangaroo court and you did nothing wrong. Um, just as you knew the day it happened, there was nothing going on. So tell us a little bit about that, about taking this charge, uh, taking this plea and then what happened with the charges. Right. First of all, there was tremendous animosity from the judge. As I mentioned, he was completely inaccurate and biased, said five people died. I showed no remorse, et cetera. Curiously enough, he spent a lot of time talking trash about America's frontline doctors. He was personally offended by America's frontline doctors. There was a lot of letters of support written on my behalf from various Americans all across the nation. And he held them up in his hand as though that was something bad, that, that people were supporting me. He spoke uh, very viciously against the fact that America's Frontline Doctors fundraised, and he said something along the lines that I'm profiting from my crimes. And let's make it super clear, any funds that are ever raised are going right to America's Frontline Doctors and not to Simone Gold. I draw a small salary that's lower than my physician salary because I work for a nonprofit, but all the funds ever raised for America's Frontline Doctors go to America's Frontline Doctors. And it so happened that I took the ethical high road and paid my own law bills, legal bills, attorney bills myself. So I found that particularly offensive. We really are living in, in, in very, uh, it was a kangaroo court. This judge was the judge in the Sussman trial, right? So he sat jurors who had donated to the Clinton campaign. But for me, he objected to America's frontline doctors and he was all about this isn't free speech and political. It was, it was really, it was just disgraceful. It was honestly, it was disgraceful. There's, an, there's a, a group that started called freedoctorgold.org and that Anyone who chooses to donate to that, those funds are used to fight for against political persecution, situations like this. I'm really afraid for our nation. I mean, when you look back at, at what's happening, you know, when I saw Peter Navarro getting arrested, I don't, I don't even know what they arrested him for. That's the truth. I'm not, I don't follow this stuff that closely. I don't know what they arrested or they're going after Steve Bannon for. But all of this is just free speech and talk, and right? So free Dr. Right. Gold, the funds raised are for this, to fight the political persecution. I love it. I'm so glad that you're that you're doing something about this and uh, taking this vested interest because this is your life and your career and look what they're trying to do to you. But you will prevail because American people will are realizing this. They have realized this since the get go and they know that this was a complete and total circus sham. And so there were people that were picked out that were put in prison right after the event. W what was the difference between the people they put in prison that have been there the whole time without um, even knowing what their charges were, even understanding what the case was about? I mean, is absolutely asinine. What, what was what was the difference? You know, I have thought about that a lot. I, I don't I, I know there's some reason for it, but I don't know. I know that they're trying so desperately to get everyone to take a plea, because when you don't take a plea and you go to trial, you have access to more discovery. And when you when you take a plea of less discovery. So I think they're particularly squeezing certain people because they want them to take a plea. I, I, that's what I surmise um, for, for all of of the rest of us as Americans, we need to be very disturbed that there's Americans sitting in prison for 18 or jail for 18 months pre-trial. This is absolutely illegal. And yet it happens. And my heart breaks for these people. Yes, that was the, uh, well, we had the Patriot Act and the NDAA and all of these things that went through. And of course, uh, when doing my interviews with certain senators who I won't name said, uh, said, oh yes, we'll never use that. It's only on paper. And it's absolutely ridiculous that an American would believe that because they had this all set up so that they could put people in jail with, and remember three Congress members tried to go see them and weren't even allowed in. How does that even happen? Who, this, who owns our country? Yeah, Louis Gohmert, Marjorie Taylor Greene. I forget who the third was, but yes. Right, right. Uh, I'm just... I, I don't know why. I will tell you that they took me down in a very violent arrest. I don't know if you know that super violent SWAT team, no. 20 officers, 12 big weapons pointed at me, <laughs> broke down my door. And you don't do that for someone like me, right? So the only reason was to scare me into silence. It won't happen. Don't worry, America. Right. 
I had no idea that happened to you. I can't even imagine. And if I were FBI agents in that situation, I would just be so embarrassed for myself at this point to call myself an American when doing that to another citizen and knowing what you're doing to that other citizen. Wouldn't you? I just, I'm perplexed that people will do things for their job that they know are so unconstitutional and over the top ridiculous. By the way, that's the answer. And that's the line that we have to keep teaching people. It's the ordinary people that need to start standing up. I will tell you for sure that at least two of the FBI agents there that day were so uncomfortable with how that day was playing out. I could see it on their face. They were a little bit ashen. They were younger and they could just see it. So if you're a nurse, a doctor, a teacher, you are a police officer, you're a hairdresser, you're a gym owner, you cannot comply with things that you know in your soul are wrong. And especially if you're a police officer. Yes. Why didn't that judge recuse himself if if he knew? I can't even imagine. I mean, or can we say mistrial? I mean, I can't even imagine the fact that uh, that that wasn't that needs to be talked about, Dr. Gold. Yeah. There's more to the that story is, that I just can't say at the moment. I but understand. one day I will. I I understand. Thank you for that, because the the more we understand about this, the more horrific it gets. And like we said before, 100 officers could have never been 140 officers could have never been assaulted. What did they do? Stand there and take take a karate kicks and punches. I mean, my gosh, it it would have never happened. The way these people were assaulted is the same the same way you're assaulted at a rock concert. You're jostling. You're next to each other. They're literally calling that an assault. You're you're standing next to someone and, you, you know, you're being pushed a little, <laughs> like a that subway, is, like it, a rock, like a rock concert. Yes. And I wish more Americans, the Americans that go, wow, 140 should be saying, how would 140 give me a break? Yeah. This could never happen ever with the police state that we're in right now, ever. Listen, it would have been a whole lot better if there had been 140 40 officers. You know, the side I yes. was on, there was like, there's like two. <laughs> Yes. But yeah, please, please show us anyone in the crowd with a mark on them, because I doubt they stood there and took it. My gosh. I mean, give me a break. Right. It's a, the whole story and sham. I would be so embarrassed to be a, a member uh, of uh, our government in D.C. right now. And uh, on that uh, little board of uh, little board of liars trying to tell these stories because they absolutely have to conjure them up in order to, to say them. But you know what's really pathetic is that the media is so bought and sold. They will not do their job and tell the truth. They refuse to. And uh, they could have actually asked questions. Boy, that would have been something new and uh, and could have actually uh, stopped with the lies. But no. And and this is what we get handed. And so people uh, believe the media. It's all your efforts as American frontline doctors that are helping people throughout this nation understand the truth about what we've been told for the last two and a half years. And that kind of honesty and integrity, when I think of Americans, I think of you. I think of the many people that put this nation first as far as truth and integrity. Thank you so much, Dr. Gold, for joining me. I really appreciate you, really. And I'm so sorry for what you're having to incur. Thank you.